thank you, Steve. You've been a massive help all the way through it. So, yeah, first of all, thank you, everyone, for joining. So, the title of this presentation is Malware Myth Busting. Probably the least technical presentation you have today from the least technical person. Um, this presentation is really all about what I would call, uh, call the malware riddle. So, uh, fighting malware sounds like a simple problem. We've heard some great presentations from some great people about um, why it is and why it isn't. But ultimately, it's about finding out if something's good or if it's bad. Uh, and if it's bad, just block it. So it should be fairly simple. But the problem we face in the industry is that the vendors claim to be great, and you've probably been to Infosec yesterday or today or tomorrow, and they all are, they've fixed it. it security's done. Um, the testers often confirm how great they are. Uh, there's some tests in the room say some of them are great. There's some really bad testers out there. Um, and most organizations are using multi-layers of malware defense. It's all best of breed technology yet we still get breached. We still get malware incidents, ransomware is increasing. The one thing you will see in pretty much every ransomware incident is they are running best of your technology. So what's going on? Um, so this presentation is really about cutting through the myths of the anti-malware industry uh, that are hindering our attempts to uh, beat malware. So a quick thing on me, uh, I've done 15 years in the industry as a technology specialist. I run a value-added reseller, so essentially we sell technology and implement it, consult, all that kind of woolly stuff. Um, but I've worked with so many vendors over the years and had a lot of NDAs that are expired over the years that I can give us some good insights onto the uh, fun that goes off out there. Uh, if you want to talk to me at any point, Twitter, like everyone else, and uh, my company Cognition, and little icon down the bottom left, uh, there's going to be a little question halfway through, and for someone, uh, whoever answers it gets a Raspberry Pi Zero. Great, so let's crack on. So the first myth, you don't need antivirus. Some of you will believe this. I will challenge you directly. Um, there's great people out there that believe it, and this is often what they say. That first of all, it's pointless, because it's just too easy to bypass it. And the second thing is, you're an upset god, so you're never going to click on that, uh, that link, get that malware. Uh, thirdly, you've got a Mac, so clearly you're immune. Uh, you know. Uh, and lastly, AV increases the threat surface, so therefore, God forbid, you should uh, do anything to protect it. Now, I like to live in the real world, and first of all, I'd say that AV might have its problems, but next-gen AV is seriously good. And I'm going to talk more about AV and next-gen AV, but the critical one here is that we all make mistakes. We all do stupid stuff. We've all got a smartphone, and we've all clicked on links probably today that without, we didn't really verify them. We all do stupid stuff all the time. We all preach on it. We all train people on it. We all do awareness training, but we're all probably as bad as our users out there. Um, yeah, Max, yeah, they get malware too. Simple. But lastly, the pros do outweigh the cons. You know, I don't care how good you are, what your OPSEC is, things will happen. So the second one is that AV is dead. You know, uh, you'll know, you hear some vendors say that. Symantec said that. Um, we've got FireEye saying prevention is dead. Um, you, so the next one is static analysis doesn't work, so you can't rely on that. Therefore, you've got to do dynamic, clearly. Um, and therefore, you need to have uh, defense in depth because that doesn't work. So let's have another layer of something else and another layer, another layer, and so on. Uh, and the only th solution is for you to buy more and place those purchase orders for the people down the road so they can keep funding pubs and stuff. So the reality is that AV is still alive, and everyone in this room is probably working for an organization that buys AV still. But it's pretty sick, and we all know that. We all talk about how uh, there are problems. Now, what's really going on is the vendors are struggling. They really all are. Um, they're missing new malware, but some are starting to miss old malware, surprisingly, as well. Um, so what's really going on is we've started to deploy layers of flawed technology. And the analogy I like to give, it's a bit like trying to catch sand in a colander. You know, some will slip through. So you say, all right, let's put another layer. Some are still going to slip through again. And we've all got work for organizations where we have multiple layers of stuff, and then we still can uh, complain, yeah, but zero days are getting through. It must be because the malware writers are so advanced. And then the other presentation, we say how lazy they are. You know, there's something clearly amiss here. Um, ultimately, the vendors are all doing a bad job, pretty much. It's just a fact. And 
classic one is that AV is cheap for a reason. Right, this is a th thing I should say about antivirus. It is really cheap. For some organizations, some banks in here, they'll be paying maybe uh, five to 10 pounds per user per year for it. And uh, they get what they pay for. So the, one of the reasons it's so cheap is because customers don't value it because we all know it doesn't work. So vendors have to keep it cheap uh, to keep the customer and retain them. And then because they've retained you, they can say, well, you've already got Symantec and would like to sell you some other complementary great solutions that will fix it. And we all know they work like NAC and DLP because they're so successful. And by keeping it cheap as well, new entrants to the market, so the new vendors out there, they come in with their price point, let's say five times higher, there's no way any of you are gonna buy it. And what do we all do when we come to a renewal point? Mr. McAfee phones up and says, well, yeah, I know you keep getting infected with ransomware, uh, but we're five pounds cheaper this year, and we all buy it. And there's, this, there's somebody in this room who, works, who worked for a very big customer uh, that did exactly that, kept getting infected with ransomware, and uh, they bought McAfee because it was a bit cheaper. So, next gen, the vendors, the traditional vendors, hate it. They call it snake oil. Um, Eugene Kaspersky called me a snake oil salesman last week, um, which I take as a compliment, really. Um, and the big argument is that ne next gen tech isn't perfect, therefore you shouldn't try it, you know, because it can't, it can't possibly work. So stick with what you know now. You know, it can't possibly work. And the one that's thrown a lot in the last sort of month or so is actually the next gen vendors are really just uh, virus total integrations wrapped around an engine. And that's all you're buying and it's snake oil, they're leeches, these people, and effectively it's bullshit. Um, so next thing as well is that you must have the internet access now. The problem has got so hard, you have to have real time updates, real time connectivity, throw everything off it to behavioral analysis in the cloud, do sandbox analysis, all that kind of stuff, because that's the only way it can scale. And ultimately, more layers, complexity is the answer for you. It's, that's, that's effectiveness. Not true at all. So next gen AV is just AV that works. The vendors don't like me saying that, but it's true. You know, whether it's silent, Sentinel-1, all these kind of things. It's just AV that works. It's nothing particularly radical. It's not the best, not amazing technology. It just fixes the AV problem and that's about it. You know, don't get too excited about it, but AV that works is great. So the point I'm trying to get across is that you can do a lot better. So traditional AV, however much you hate it, you can do better than that. Yeah, it's not perfect next gen. It's not at all, but it's a lot better than what you've got now. And the reason they hate it so much is because the term next gen is because everyone, it makes traditional AV vendors look crap and old. And you know, I'd hate that, they just hate that. Um, you'll see people come out and say, it's not next gen, we were next gen, all this kind of stuff, but ultimately, it's good stuff. Um, critical point, offline detection is now a thing. So forget internet connectivity. So you don't need to do dynamic behavioral analysis in the cloud, you don't need to have updates every 15 minutes or every minute. There are products out there that you can install today, six months later, it will still defend you from brand new zero days. That sounded like complete nonsense, but it's true. And if you want to uh, hear about some of those or see any demos, uh, just let me know. But there, that is a thing now. And ultimately, the best products are simple. The best products are the ones you install, they fix the problem and you move on to the more interesting stuff. A bit like a safe, a physical safe. It does a job, you don't get excited about it, it's not sexy but it sort of solved the problem and you can move on. We're at that stage with next gen AV now. And behavioral analysis, relying on that, can start to get a bit risky because you're letting stuff run. How do you bypass that? We've heard some great things about how you do bypass that. It's not as, it's not as difficult as you might think. And ultimately it comes back to that thing of you can have cheap or you can have good. And a bit like a car airbag, you know, when you get hit, do you want cheap or do you want good? And you know, look at any malware ransomware incident, and you know you don't want cheap. So the experts, there's some lot of experts. Most of them are in the show down the road. You should all trust those. And uh, there are three on here uh, that you may recognise. Uh, the classic one you'll hear when you go to any of the stands at Infosec is "We're better because da 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 da." And the next one is, and we scored 
100% in this test. And they always pick out the 100% from different places. And bravado is a big thing as well. You'll hear the classic one, never pay the ransom. Whatever you do, don't pay the ransom. You shouldn't ever pay the ransom. There's a thing that came out today about the uh, $20,000 ransom that was paid uh, yesterday. Uh, that was appalling. They shouldn't have done it in absolutely no way. Um, and a great quote from one of the people on here was that false positives are worse than false negatives. Now, I'd argue differently from malware, but hey, you know. And the last one, APT, 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 uh, you know, clearly, APT is the biggest problem. Nation states are your biggest problem, clearly. You know, you're facing that today. You're worried about China and not uh, just plain old ransomware. So I've got three people on here. Um, Raspberry Pi. Uh, can anyone name all, th put that hand up. Can anyone name all three of those people? All three. All three. Two? <laughs> Go for it. Uh, no, behind, sorry. Baitlick. Yeah. And what company does, it, does he work for? Uh, Kaspersky's an easy one to work out. Uh, yeah. Cool. That's yours. You can get that afterwards. Um, guy in the middle, Simon Crosby, uh, CTO of Bromium. Now, he's interesting because he's been instigating the Bromium 10K challenge at InfoSet this week. So the idea was, if you can bypass Bromium, we'll give you £10,000. You know, fantastic. Uh, create your own executables and stuff. Um, marketing can backfire. So what happened at the weekend was uh, Tavis Or Ormandy from uh, Google, uh, fairly infamous, he got hold of Bromium software. An hour later, he'd created a bypass. Uh, and the next day, £10,000 was being shipped his way, which he's kindly giving to Amnesty International. But the point is that these three guys here uh, from Mandiant, FireEye, uh, Bromium, and Kaspersky say a lot of really big claims, you know, whether it be don't pay ransoms, false positives are worse than false negatives. Uh, I'm not going to say who, who said that one. Um, <laughs> but people are making claims because they're trying to push you in a direction. And I would say, um, don't trust them. Vendors know very little about their competition. The way vendors find out about the competition is when they hire people, they say, right, you've just joined from McAfee, tell me all about it. I'll give you an example. Uh, someone joined uh, Silence recently, interviewed someone that just left. Uh, two people just left two, other, two AV vendors. Both the sales engineers said, there's a policy within those companies that they're not allowed to touch malware. So imagine that, Symantec SE comes onto your site and says, I'm going to give you a demo, and you say, can you give me some malware and play around? He goes, not allowed. Because they're so paranoid about the leeching of malware into the organization. So, you know, if, if, the, if the employees aren't allowed to touch malware, think about what that might mean. So, importantly, I'm biased. Everyone's biased. Testers biased, everyone's biased. You're all biased. We're all biased by our experience and what we've seen. So within the community, uh, gang rivalry is massively fierce as well. So you've got the traditional AV vendors. They hate next-gen AV vendors. And you've also got the isolation vendors who hate the sandbox vendors. They all hate each other, but they pack together. And they won't argue with each other. If you notice the, inter, so the intra uh, conversations between, let's say, Symantec, traditional AV vendors, they don't uh, argue much anymore. So there's a lot of pack rivalry. But ultimately, focus on your threats and risks. Don't trust those experts. And lastly, trust the testers. Now, this is a, a key one. Everyone says you must trust the testers because they're independent, they perform real world testing, and they all use random samples. It's what we've all come to believe. But again, I would say trust no one. Uh, respect the testers. There are some brilliant testers out there, some brilliant methodologies out there. But be skeptical and follow the money. Independent, test, independent testing can be very, very flawed because we need to look at where the motivation is coming from to do the test. We need to look at what is real world for them. Is it real world for you? You know, if you work in finance, is that the same real world threat as if you work for GCHQ? Don't trust anyone. Don't trust me. Don't trust the vendors. Don't trust the testers. Respect their input and then go from there. Test the products yourself for your organization. So this year, there's been uh, lots of tests going on. And generally, there's some signs of dodginess to look out for when you're looking at any test from anybody. 
Uh, first of all, look for bias, so motivation, finance. Why was the test done? You know, testers come from testing companies. They are motivated by money to do a test. There's always a reason to do a test. It costs money. So look at that. Was it uh, Samantha paid for a test to go and do something? Um, or was it we're looking to critique X, Y, and Z? But look at that, because that usually drives an angle for a test. But look for personal opinions. And you may not be able to read that. There's a test this year performed where uh, they wanted to get two copy, eval copies of the software to test. And they couldn't get one of them because it is, but it, you have to set up an AWS and they couldn't get a, a CD copy of it. So in the test results, they actually put this commentary that it looks like they tried to avoid getting tested in order to continue to attract users simply by unproven marketing uh, claims. Now, if you're hearing that personal opinion in an in independent test report, uh, try and work out what, what's really going on. There's a bias going on. Uh, perfect scores, watch out for them. Are they perfect? Is that product perfect? Should it be getting a perfect score? And look for methodologies and how relevant they are to you. Is a scoring relevant to you? And virus total, you've heard that mentioned a few times today, but ultimately all the AV vendors are members of virus total and they get all the input from virus total. So if you download malware from virus total, all the vendors should get 100% on that every single time because they've got it they get it pretty much real time. So this year, uh, there's been a lot of tests, as I mentioned, and uh, some bad stuff that's gone on. Samples, there's been independent tests where they've excluded ransomware. You know, a major one had that. They didn't look at packed malware because they said that's not, there's not that much in the real world. They didn't try and break it. They didn't go hard at it. They used non-corporate stuff in a corporate test. So they said, we've, we've thrown some um, where's games at it. We've downloaded some dodgy stuff. You know, it's like relevant if you work in a bank. Should you be allowing those kind of things anyway? Um, some use the wrong AV versions of the product. Uh, one had a usability test, and the only score to measure it uh, was how many false positives they got. Now, I don't know about you, but I didn't see that as a usability test. Uh, performance testing, one, te one dropped 15,000 Ps into a directory, and let's see how it goes. You know, is that performance testing for you? Um, Testing Mac malware on Windows, it doesn't run. So let's give it a score zero out of 100 for some people. So others picked it up. So there's a lot of dodginess going on, but there's also some real good stuff going on. The challenge is for you to try and pick it apart and just take the input and be critical of it. So what you can do is, first of all, be skeptical. Don't be cynical, but be skeptical. Be, don't assume everything's bad, just, but just, be, just try and pick it apart and look for what's good. But be optimistic, because there is some really great tech out there now. You know, we, are, we have really, really moved on recently. I would urge you to pause what you're doing if it involves traditional AV. I'm not saying move away from it at all. I'm just saying pause anything that you haven't really looked into and just do some dang good testing. So what you can do is get a good VAR, like a value-added reseller. There's loads around, but essentially, your organization, if you buy products at the moment, you'll be able to say to the reseller, OK, well, I want a day of your time for free to come inside with a little malware lab. Let's create some zero days. Let's pack some stuff. Let's play. Let's break your products. And let's see what works for my environment. Let's see what I think is important for performance testing. And make it relevant for you. Get your hands dirty. Be skeptical of me. Don't trust anyone, especially me. Don't trust the vendors. Uh, get playing. And uh, hopefully, you should start to beat the malware problem. Thank you. Got a time for any questions? Uh, we've got time for a couple of questions for anyone, or if anything's deep dive, pounce on me afterwards. Go on, okay. oh, no, I'll go for the lady first. Um, like genuine kind of open question. Yeah. So I think, I mean, I know for some things like Mimikatz, there's a lot of uh, argument about what is, what is malicious as opposed to what is bad. And some people say, well, Mimikatz is a legit tool, so is PSExec, therefore you shouldn't do it. Um, so you shouldn't pick it up. 
Uh, there's some weirdness going on in Virus Total, and Martin probably had a lot of input, but there's, it's often sort of political on that. But yeah, but even within straight malware, there is, there is some inconsistencies. Um, so people should be able to get 100% off Virus Total, which is, I guess is why they say don't use it as a comparative test. But great question, thank you. Martin. It's a great point. There is a marketing war going on. The next gen AV vendors make it sound like AV doesn't work at all and does nothing. Uh, the traditional AV vendors think the next gen doesn't do anything at all. It all depends on the size of the problem. If you say that traditional AV gets 99% of malware, or if you're Symantec, they claim it does 50%, then of that 1%, how important is that 1% to you? Uh, for some organizations, they'll live with that because it's, it's fine. But if inside that 1%, that, re that is ransomware, or inside all of that 1%, then suddenly it's a problem. So the scale of the uh, marketing war is an issue. Um, in terms of how Next Gen AV works, the two main players are Silence and Sentinel-1. Silence works statically, no behavior analysis at all. So you give it a file, it doesn't need to run it or anything, it just looks at it statically and tells you what it does. Uh, Sentinel-1 lets it run purely uh, behavioral. Both work offline. So they would argue that is a fundamental Next Gen shift from cloud interactivity. So, Thank you, guys. Thank you, everyone.